Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Alpha Wave Semi with Archana Cherulio. I'm going to talk today about the evolution of HBM. Archana, we've seen HBM 1, 2, and 3. What happens when we get to HBM 4? Yes, it's a very exciting time for HBM technology. Uh, the newest uh, standard is HBM 4. Um, it's doubling the number of I.O. bits from 1,024 bits in HBM 3 going to 2,048 bits um, in HBM 4, essentially doubling the bandwidth. Um, and with that also comes the increase in the data rate that HBM technology can support. So we are looking at supporting up to 3 terabytes per second of bandwidth, total bandwidth going to HBM 4 technology. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Archana, what are we looking at? So with the changing landscape of HBM4, what we're seeing is that, especially driven by the AI hardware, specialized AI hardware today, because of the extreme parallelism, requires data to be closely coupled with compute logic. What that means is that you need reduced latency and increased bandwidth to support all of the different parallelism in compute that we are seeing with um, AI accelerators and GPU type of logic. What I'm showing you here today is with the evolution of HPM4, what we are seeing is how closely you couple your memory to your core is kind of the differentiating factor in terms of your total performance of your full system. What I'm showing you here today is a custom implementation of your memory base die. In earlier generations, what we saw was that the HPM3 technology uh, was communicating through a 2.5D package through a memory phi, uh, through the 2.5D package like an interposer to talk to the core. Uh, going forward in HPM4 technology, what we're seeing is that we are coupling a lot more logic onto the base die of the HPM custom memory die. What can you do with all that logic? What changes? What this gives you is the flexibility now to really customize your controller. Say it could be for reduced latency, increased bandwidth, lower power, um, also to meet custom workload requirements of these AI machines, right? So what that allows you is to pack in all that customization right into the memory base die and then talk to your DRAMs through TSV files. And it's not just standard HBM anymore, right? Now we're starting to get into customization of this through the logic. Exactly. By, mostly driven by, you know, large language model kind of uh, computations, what we are seeing is the requirement to kind of have customization, especially on how you uh, access memory, how quickly you access it and how much of it you do it, especially for AI training, is changing rapidly. What that means that is that you kind of need to kind of not have one stop solution for all different use cases. You kind of really need to customize the controller for per use case, which means that, you know, there might be certain cases which require uh, higher bandwidth, right, can, but can live with slightly larger latencies. There are certain applications that require really low latencies, but where extremely high bandwidths. That's where such implementation kind of comes into play. When you're dealing with DRAM, you really don't want heat in there. Now you're adding a lot more logic in the bottom. What's the impact of that? How do you manage that, that heat? Exactly. That's a big problem when it comes to anytime you stack um, logic on top of logic, right? That's a, how do you dissipate all of that energy? Especially with DRAMs, it, it, it just does not like heat, right? It gets more leakier as the temperature in there starts to increase. Now we are talking about packing more logic onto the memory die, which means you're dealing with all of these challenges of how do you dissipate thermal uh, across all of these different stacks. And what's the solution? The solution really is to have really efficient controllers in there, right, that are designed at the leading process nodes. Another advantage of doing a custom memory die is that now you have the option to kind of disaggregate this and really manufacture this on the leading edge process nodes, which have better performance in terms of power and thermals. You've got a couple other elements in here that are really challenging too. So you've got a lot more data, you've got more stacks of DRAM, which is basically what is HBM, and now you have to move some of this data very fast to wherever you're going to be using it for processing and then back again to storage. How do you do that? So one of the advantages to actually doing a custom implementation is that you already have a die where your show line is already reserved for some type of a die-to-die -die interface. You basically can repurpose that die-to-die -die interface now to transmit or stream your data 
um, either through Axie or some sort of a streaming protocol over to your SOC core logic die. So basically you're repurposing some of the already existing die to die interface between the two, between the SOC die and your memory die. So we talked about four, what happens on three? There's some changes going on there as well, right? Correct. So it's very interesting. What we've seen with HPM3 and now 3E, the latest standard, is that AI is really driving the data rates to be higher and higher. As you will see, see in the JDEC standard bodies that HPM3 started out as 6.4 gig, um, and now we are crossing the limits all the way up to 10 Gbps on HPM3E. We're going to see a very similar trend starting with HPM4 as well, where JDEC is defining the generation one spec to be at six gigahertz. Very soon, we're going to see generation two at eight Gbps, and we are already seeing customers ask for double that data rate very soon. So what we're seeing is that the end use case is kind of driving the need for higher and higher bandwidth, in turn kind of influencing the JDEC body to kind of up the data rates on HPM4. Go back five, 10 years ago, everybody thought DRAM is coming to the end of its life. It will be replaced by some other type of memory. It's got a whole new life here. Where do you see this getting used in the memory hierarchy and is that changing? Yes, actually it's very interesting. So for example, with HPM4, we are talking about all 16 high devices, right? So 16 layers of DRAM. And especially with the custom implementation now, with your memory sitting closer and closer to your core compute, you could almost get rid of your level three cache and this could act as your, your cache. The latencies are so low that it almost mimics like a cache transaction, but at extremely high bandwidth and extremely low latency. So it's a game changer in terms of how quickly you can access data, especially for some of these specialized AI hardware systems. So now the question is, how do you move the data faster in and out? So one way we can do this is using a die-to-die -die interface, right? So Today, the UCIE is a very popular die to die interface that is in, introduced into the industry. Um, it can operate all the way up to 24 gigabits per second. Um, AlphaWave Semi has recently announced our availability of 24 Gbps UCIE uh, in three nanometer process. And going forward, we're also seeing the trend moving up to 32 Gbps and up to 36 Gbps. So given this extremely high data rate of the UCIE. Now you can pack multiple links, uh, UCIE modules on the show line and quickly transmit data from your memory to your SOC core logic through a die-to-die -die interface. And, and this becomes a chiplet race too, because you really want to assemble these things very quickly, right? That's correct. And if you think about it, HPM was the first chiplet of its kind. Um, going forward, chiplets are getting more complex, right? Where you can disaggregate a chiplet basically based on either function or you do it based on your process node, right? So where basically you have your compute on your latest and greatest uh, technology node, and you keep some of your IOs and memory on your older technology nodes. So your custom memory based die could potentially be on an older process node, right? So which could also potentially drive down the cost of overall total cost of ownership of the full SOC. And you could really keep your compute and your core logic on the latest three nanometer, two nanometer process nodes. On the chiplet side, you've got chiplets coming in from multiple vendors. How's all that going to work here? That's that's very interesting. I think it will require immense collaboration across the industry, right? Not just from your IP vendors, um, across your DRAM vendors. You will need also testability, right? How do you make sure if there are failures between chiplets, how do you test that? So there's another whole layer of DFT, what kind of uh, defects, you know, how do you detect it early on? Um, so th this requires immense collaboration across the industry. Here at AlphaWave Semi, for example, if you're implementing a custom memory-based die, not only do you require an IP like a memory controller uh, that can be highly configurable, you need to now closely work with a DRAM vendor to kind of implement the whole custom-based die. It takes an ecosystem to build one of these. Absolutely. In addition to that, you also need some sort of an ASIC capability, like a custom silicon implementation capability. And here at AlphaWave Semi, we also have a um, custom silicon uh, group, which implements custom ASIC dice. Archana Chiroyo, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much.